Okay, so what I'm talking about today is fundamentals of atmospheric modelling. It would have been nice if Gab had had his um, had the opportunity to give his lecture before me, but I think it goes just as well at the end um, because he talks about what models are and what they're used for and what we should use them for and what perhaps we shouldn't use them for. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about that too much today, but really to start off by saying that we have models for a number of reasons and our models are, are different to uh, some other fields, right? We, all, many fields of science and social sciences use the term models. And our models are quite different because our models are really dynamical and physical models that are based on equations of motion and laws of physics, whereas other models in other fields, um, they'll use the term model for um, a line fit to data and things like that. A regression is a model for, for the social scientists. And so ours are models, uh, geologists will call ours forward models sometimes because they, they step forward in time. Um, and so just, just bear that in mind because it's, it's really interesting when you talk to different fields and you say, oh, I, I do modelling, I model the atmosphere. And one question that you often get is, well, where do you get all the data to fit your curves to create your models? And that's actually not what we do. Right? We're, we're using these dynamical models that solve equations and solve approximations to equations that are consistent with the laws of physics. So my lecture has two parts and I'm actually not sure how long each part is going to take. Um, so uh, they could go quickly, they might take a long time. I think we've got a little bit of time up our sleeve um, and so if I go too long I think that's okay, isn't it? Um, but we will have a break in the middle after about an hour. Everyone can um, stretch their legs, go to the bathroom for about five minutes. So the first part is really about modelling components and types. Now, for those of you who have been in this field for a while and have been running models or using models or coding, some of this maybe you may know all this stuff. Um, and there may be some things you don't know. So just bear with me. This is the first lecture of the, of the whole winter school. So some of it may be new to some of you and some of you may not be new. Um, but sometimes it's useful to hear these things from a different person, from a different perspective as well. So the outline for this first hour is really um, types of atmospheric models. You could call that hierarchies of models, model components, um, numerical representation, how we... How we approach the solution of these model components, sources of error and boundary conditions. And then I'll move on to other more complicated things in the second hour. So let's start with this. Here's a nice visualisation from a global climate model. This is the NCAR climate model and at about 0.35 degree resolution which is about 30 or 40, about 40 kilometer resolution. Yeah. Okay, so here's a visualization from this climate model. So it's a high resolution climate model. This is the NCAR climate model. And what we're showing here is essentially water vapor. So the shading is water vapor. And the um, orangey color is precipitation. And so you can see that this model is is evolving in time. It has numerous features, it has numerous scales of motion as well. Um, and you can see the atmosphere interacting with the, with the coastlines and the topography and the land masses and the ocean. Okay, so this highlights some of the complexity in these models that we have. We've got land, we've got ocean, we've got ice, We've got mountains, we've got coastlines, we've got clouds, we've got water vapour, we've got phase changes and also we've got, if you look closely, you might be able to see that there's a bit of a blinking pattern. You can see the blinking between the Africa and South America, it's kind of going like that. That's the diurnal cycle popping in. So you've got change in radiation as well. And at the same time, this is a coupled climate model, so the ocean is doing something too. So there's coupling between both the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land surface. So this is basically the, the game that we're in, climate modelling, and this is basically um, 
the epitome of what we're trying to achieve. Create models that simulate um, the climate system in a realistic way. Now we can use models like this for a number of things. We can use models like this for prediction, what's going to happen in the future. We can use models like this to understand processes, so how, do the, how does the complex physics of the atmosphere and the ocean interact? Something that we can't just do on pen and paper, paper because it's too complicated. Something that is hard to understand because of the complexity of the geometry and the physical processes that are interacting. So we can learn about the climate system using models like this. Um, we can also conduct experiments. Right? Our models that we use, are the, we, use, we can use them, we don't always use them, but we can use them for experimentations. This is our lab. And I know there are people who actually take observations and actually work in a real lab here and work with chemistry and work with aerosols and, and um, work with instruments. But the other experiments that we do are with models. And so we can con conduct controlled experimentations, experiments. We can conduct reproducible experiments as well. And that's really the foundation of science. So this is our laboratory. Now, to conduct experiments with models, you normally have to do something hard, like get inside the code and change something. Change a physics scheme, change an input file, change something about the model to conduct an experiment. So that's, that's the hard part, and that's where many people stop. Because we can do things useful with models without getting inside the code, such as predictions and projections and other things. All right, let's see if I can get the other one working. And then there's no more YouTube for me. All right, so this is another model. And this re received quite wide publicity um, a couple of months ago. Uh, this was released by the Bureau of Meteorology and NCI, this visualisation. And this is a visualisation of the, the BARA model. And BARA stands for... Jen, what does Barra stand for? Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology, uh... Atmospheric <laughs> Regional Rain. <laughs> but A is, A is atmosphere. I think it's Bureau of Meteorology. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Regional Reanalysis. There you go. So Barra is a reanalysis. And many people use reanalysis products, and you've probably heard of the era interim Reanalysis. You might have heard of ERA-5 um, reanalysis or NCAR, NCEP reanalysis or the MERA reanalysis, all these reanalysis products. This is the Australian Regional Reanalysis, BARA. What a re and we often think of reanalyses as our best set of observations that are nice and continuous and gridded and uniform and reliable. Reanalyses are model products. They come from models. It's a process called assimilation, and you're going to hear about assimilation later in the week. Once your head's full of information, you'll have an electron reanalysis, which will make your head even more full. Oh, assimilation, sorry. Um, but reanalyses come from models. It's a fusion of data and observations and models that are brought together to create the best data set we can, but you can't escape the fact that a reanalysis is a model product and it has the inherent errors and the inherent biases that a model has. Okay, so always keep that in mind, that reanalysis is not perfect, it is a model product. And so you can look at this, and while this looks realistic, I look at this and look at the clouds in particular, I see some features in there that don't quite look real to me. And so you just need to be careful that with a reanalysis product, some of the weaknesses that we know about in models, like clouds and precipitation, are also in those reanalysis products. All right, let's go back to PowerPoint and see if I can continue my success with technology. All right. Here's another animation. This is from a regional model. This is work that was done by Claire Vincent, who 
was a postdoc with the Center of Excellence in Climate System Science and has moved on to a, a lecturer, lecturer position here at Melbourne. And this is using a model called the WARF model, the Res Weather Research and Forecasting model. And this is an, a model that is nested within a reanalysis product. So this is often termed by nesting a model, putting a high resolution model inside a lower resolution um, data set. It's often called downscaling or dynamical downscaling because it's not a statistical approach. You embed a dynamical model inside this data set. And you can do that within a climate model, a climate model projection, or you can do it within a reanalysis re like we have here. And you can do it over large areas and um, run it over long periods. And so Claire, for this, exper for this project, she ran 10 years of this um, high resolution nested simulation. Here's a different model. This is really a cloud resolving model. And this is, uh, we're looking at processes that govern the initiation and organisation of convection around Darwin. And we use a nested approach like the dynamical downscaling approach, but this is much more um, related to numerical weather prediction where you treat it like an initial value problem. You start off with a data set, look at the initial conditions and try and simulate or reproduce certain cases. So here we have clouds, which are the, the white fluffy things, and precipitation, which are the blue cores, uh, associated with intense convection near Darwin. We've done it with a variety of nested simulations, and this one um, is one kilometre grid spacing, and soon this is going to zip around and show our highest resolution, which is 400 metres. So once we get to these different scales, we can start to reproduce different physics, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail later. But the reason why we go to higher and higher resolution is to reproduce coastline features, reproduce topography in a more realistic way, but also get to the bottom of the physics and the physical processes that may not be resolved on a coarser resolution grid. You can watch this for a little while. And so you can see these clouds interacting with each other and storms moving through and interest, interacting with the coast and um, different clouds at different altitudes moving in different directions, right? So there's a, a great deal of complexity here. Okay, let's move on. So here's my schematic of a coupled climate model. AGCM, Atmospheric General Circulation Model, everything in this big circle. And this Atmospheric General Circulation Model interacts with an ocean model and a sea ice model. The arrows are going in both directions, so they're coupled. So the atmosphere forces the ocean, the ocean forces the atmosphere. We have land surface models and urban models as well. Sorry, Melissa, I should have written the word urban there. Um, where they're also two-way interactive, they're coupled. So the precipitation falling on the ground modifies the land surface, which then feeds back on the, on the atmosphere, for example. And then we have normally imposed forcing of some description. It's not simulated per se, but imposed, such as solar cycles and volcanic emissions or volcanic eruptions and anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are imposed through um, certain scenarios moving into the future or if you're looking at past scenarios where observed, emission, um, observed concentrations of greenhouse gases are used. And within our atmospheric model, we have all these components. At the centre of it is a dynamical core. Now, Talk about what a dynamical core is in a minute. But there's other models and parameterizations in here as well. Convection and clouds, which are parameterized normally. Turbulence and mixing, which is also normally parameterized. Chemistry and aerosols, boundary layer processes, and radiation. I'm sure I've missed something. But these are, the, these are things that are really at the heart of our 
atmospheric models. And our dynamical core, I'm not sure why that arrow is there. But you can ignore that arrow because there's lots of arrows. These all interact with one another and are all coupled together and all intertwined. And in many ways, they're inseparable. The clouds react to what's going on in the boundary layer. The boundary layer reacts to the radiation, the clouds react to the radiation, the radiation reacts to the clouds. Turbulence and mixing is, um, interacts with almost all of these, as does chemistry. Okay, so there's a lot of interactions, and um, while we often think of these components separately, say, I'm an expert on microphysics and I work on the microphysics scheme in the model, right? You have to know what's going on in other components of the model because they, are, they do all interact. And so we often think sometimes with our community models that we use that there's this plug-and-play approach where we can take a component and plug it into the model and just work on that component in isolation. Now, you can do that, but it's not ideal. And, and the best approach is perhaps a unified approach where all the, all the parameterizations are designed and implemented together so they're all done in a physically consistent way. Now we can simplify these models, such as the thing I like to do, and not offending the chemists, but I like to remove chemistry. Right. And, but you can remove chemistry, you can remove radiation, you can move, remove clouds if you want. And that level of complexity depends on your application. For example, this, this schematic here is really a, well, if you, if you remove the anthropogenic emissions and remove the solar cycles and volcanoes, that's your numerical weather prediction model don't really need chemistry in your NWP model because of the time scales involved. Um, you do need land surface interaction. You don't really need coupling between um, the atmosphere and the ocean on very short time scales. But as you go to longer time scales, you do. And so the complexity of the model that you use depends very much on the application. And so when we're talking about model experimentation, in particular, we simplify our models so that we can isolate the key processes that we're interested in looking at. And so you may find that people will simplify the modeling systems that they use to remove this, 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 for example. Just need to do that judiciously. Okay, the dynamical core. Who's heard that term before? A few of you? Okay. The dynamical core is this. Solving the equations of motion. Who's seen these equations before? Almost everybody? Good. Okay. So these have a number of names. You could call them the Navier-Stokes equations. They're not exactly the Navier-Stokes equations. These are really the, the primitive equations. You could call them the primitive equations or the forced Euler equations, but basically they're the equations of motion that govern a fluid, a rotating fluid. Um, essentially, Newton's second law of motion and mass conservation. That's really what they are. And so these terms, U, V, and W, are our velocity components. P is pressure. Rho is density. So here's our mass conservation. Theta here is potential temperature, so a thermodynamic relation and T is temperature. Um, so that's what we're trying to solve, the dynamical core. Now here these all have forcings. There should be forcing, oh there is a forcing on temperature as well. These forcings come from physics. These forcings can come from parameterizations. So these extra terms, and there's actually quite a lot of them on the right hand side, there's a tendency exerted on the flow in some way, on these equations in some way that comes from the model physics. Think of radiation or think of um, latent heating from convection. 
There's also a forcing on this flow based on um, parameterization of unresolved processes as well. And we'll talk about that in more detail in the second hour. Now, the exact form of this equation depends on the coordinate system you're using. If you're doing this as a spherical system, like our global climate models are, then there's all these scary spherical terms in there. If you're doing it on a regular Cartesian coordinate system, those spherical terms disappear. Um, and the vertical coordinate also depends on the assumptions that you use as well. And so, I, in hindsight, I probably would have spent an hour talking about vertical coordinates, but you wouldn't have got much out of that. I know in the ocean lecture tomorrow, you're going to hear a lot about vertical coordinate systems. Um, but we can solve these equations in pressure coordinates if we want, as pressure is our vertical coordinate. Height coordinates, we normally use some version of a terrain following height coordinate system or a mass based coordinate system. And so all these things vary depending on um, the model that you're using and the problem that you're trying to solve. So how do we solve our dynamical core? Now this is the essentially the same as the ocean and the atmosphere. We use some form of finite difference methods with varying degrees of complexity. Um, we could use spectral methods or grid-based methods, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Actually, I'll go to spectral methods now and then I'll come back. So spectral methods... Uh, Instead of discretizing the equations on a grid, you do some kind of spectral transformation and, and transform those equations into spectral space. It sounds complicated, and here's the complicated, complicated equation that the ECMWF use, and psi is a variable, one of your variables, and y and p are your... Um, a spectral basis function. Now this is really useful for a sphere because you can decompose everything on a sphere into a sum of spectral components. And if, and you know, a spectral component causes and signs, right? Sum of causes and signs thing about causes and cosines and sines is you can take a derivative of them analytically and you have an exact derivative. Okay, so that's the benefits of spectral methods are that our sphere lends itself naturally to decomposing the signal as a sum of sines and cosines and if you do that the spatial derivatives, derivatives are exact. But if you do that, if you solve them using spectral methods, all the physics that we do, so if we solve the dynamics of spectral methods, all the physics that we do is on a grid. The land is a grid. All those complex features, you can't represent those properly spectrally or very well. And so with spectral models, there's this continual change between doing a transformation into spectral space and then every time set back to grid point space to do all the physics calculations and then back to spectral space, vice versa. Okay, so that's, that's what happens in spectral methods. So a lot of the older climate models and older forecast models used a combination of spectral and grid-based methods. And so as I said, the advantage is an exact representation of horizontal derivatives on a sphere, but this physics step has to be completed on the grid. The other way to do it is purely as a grid-based model, and most models are moving towards a pure grid-based model approach. And certainly that's what all the regional models do, purely a grid, just finite difference methods on a grid. We often use approximations to the equation set, a hydrostatic approximation. Newer models aren't using the hydrostatic approximation anymore as you go to higher and higher resolution. But all older traditional numerical weather prediction models were all hydrostatic because it was a simplification to the equation set. Um, there's other 
more sophisticated approximations like anelastic or uh, a reduced compressibility, and that's to eliminate sound waves, essentially, because sound waves propagate really quickly, they create instabilities in your model, and we really don't need to be predicting sound in our climate models, but they're a result of the atmosphere being compressible. So they're approximations that are made to the equation set, and the vertical coordinate that I talked about earlier, we can use height, pressure, terrain following, etc. In terms of spectral models, you often hear about the spectral model resolution being quoted as T255. You think, what does that mean? It's really confusing. It's, it's really the level of truncation or how many spectral modes you have. Here's something straight from UCAR. ACMWF has it as well, where you can convert from T255 to the number of latitude and longitude points, the grid spacing at the equator and the equivalent grid. Etc. Um, it would take probably an hour to explain what the, the T, what these truncation methods mean. So it's probably better to just know that they exist and know where you can look up what they mean. Okay, so here's here's a, a typical latitude longitude grid on a sphere, and you can see that near the equator, it's nice and regular. The latitude and longitude points are uh, spaced equally, but then once you move up to the North Pole or the South Pole, something happens because these lines of constant longitude get closer together. And so it's very difficult to um, define your grid on a sphere in this particular way. It causes problems with your numerics because your, your grid points get very close together and you can generate instabilities. And so there are a number of ways around this, and what the European Centre does is they um, reduce the number of grid points at the poles to try and make them closer, uh, evenly spaced or more evenly spaced compared to the mid-latitudes in the equatorial region. Um, there can be filters that are applied on the polar regions that can slow down the model. Um, or what most modern models are doing now is not using a lat-long-based grid, but using a confusing hexagonal-based grid, where you can actually have a uniform grid over the entire sphere, um, and this grid is broken up into these hexagons, which look really cool. Now, this is from uh, what's called the MPAS model, which comes out of NCAR, which is the uh, a modern um, model that's really going to be the, the dynamical core of their future climate models as well, and regional models, because you can see that one advantage of this approach is that you can do grid refinement very easily where you put smaller and smaller hexagons in here, and so this particular case has uniform hexagon size on this part of the planet, but over the US has much finer hexagon size. So this is an alternate to nesting because it all happens within the one grid. Uh, this is the way basically all models, all global climate models are going to go into the future. Um, the complication of this is that you're running, running one model. So your physics for this one model, <laughs> what you'll find in this building is that almost 100% of the time there's construction going on somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they always seem to drill into the walls. So we are, I think we're just going to have to work through this, unfortunately. Um, so physics. The physics done on this grid here has to work on this grid here. And so it requires the, the development of what are called scale-aware physics schemes. Now, traditionally with, with models, whether it be a climate model or a weather prediction model, let me do this. Turn my mic up just a little bit. Um, whether it be a climate model or a weather prediction model, they, all the physics that's done on that grid is tuned. Tuned to provide the best possible outcome for your forecast or your climate projection. 
And so you think about, you hear about uh, centres saying, oh, we're, we're going to increase the resolution of our model, we're going to increase the resolution of our um, next generation forecast model, and it's not just a matter of going in and reducing the grid spacing and saying, okay, dx equals five now, number of points is increased. It takes them a year or two of tuning that model, increasing the resolution, then making sure all the physics works really nicely on that model. All right? So all our models are heavily tuned. Don't let anyone tell you they're not heavily tuned because they are. Um, but if you're now going to change the resolution, you need... Um, physics that works coarse resolution and fine resolution. Okay, so so that is um, that is the challenge with these schemes. They need to be scale aware. All right, computational limits. Think about the size of, of these calculations that you're doing with climate models. If you go go back twenty years ago, and you look at the top 10 supercomputer lists, you know that you've seen these before, where every year there's a, there's a list of the top 500 or the top 50 or whatever supercomputers in terms, in terms of their size, and all the supercomputing centres are trying to get to the top of that list, and, and they get to the top of the list, and then a year later they, they move down the list because there's so much competition in that space, right? Go back 20 years, probably eight of the top 10 on those lists were from weather prediction centres. Right? So because of the size of the computations that have to be done. Now, as funding priorities have changed and the massive increases in computing power by, by companies like Google and Amazon, things like that, um, the weather prediction centres are, are slowly moving down the, down the list. And also the upgrade cycle of these these computers are such that you get into onto the list. Like Rigen was was definitely top fifty when it started, and within a year it dropped way down. Right, and this is just what happens. And now Rigen is way down the list because it's a couple of years old. Okay, think about the the number of calculations you have to do. This is just for the dynamical core. If we split up the grid two by two, two point five by two point five degrees across the sphere. It's about 10,000 cells, about seven variables for a dynamical core. So that's more than 2 million variables. Let's say about 20 calculations for every variable. So that's 42 million calculations per time step. 2 billion calculations per day, 73 trillion calculations for a 100 year climate model simulation. And then you say, you know what, I'd really like to reduce the grid spacing in every direction by half. That increases the computational cost by a factor of 16. How do you get 16? Double in the x direction, double in the y direction, double in the z direction. So that's 2 times 2 times 2, that's 8. And when you reduce the grid spacing, you normally have to reduce the time step by the same amount. So that's another factor of two. Now, different models, you may not have to reduce the time step by that much based on their stability criteria. But you can see, say, I really want the Bureau of Meteorology for their weather prediction to double the resolution of their weather prediction models. It's a significant, it's more than an order of magnitude more computations required to do that. So that's why there's this slow progression in time to increase the resolution of our models. And as Gab would have told you this morning, and I'm sure he'll tell you on Friday, if he's well enough, hopefully he is, the tendency is to take our models not only to increase their resolution, but to make them much more complicated. Adding more variable, add, adding more variables, adding more complications. So that evolution to that next generation model is not just increasing the resolution, it's adding all this stuff in the model to make it, hopefully, presumably, more accurate and more realistic, and that's not always the case. So there's this competition between complexity and resolution, which is always going on with model development, developers. 
Okay, beyond um, global models, we have nested models. And this is an example of nesting. This is multiple nests going down where you take, like that animation I showed you at the start, we take some large-scale data set, where it could be a global model prediction, it could be a reanalysis data set, it could be... Um, yeah, they're really the two options. Um, and you nest within it. So you take the initial conditions and the boundary conditions from that global model or that larger-scale model, and you put a domain within it. And that domain, in this case, had 34-kilometre grid spacing, then we put another domain within that, and that interior domain takes its initial conditions and boundary conditions from the course of domain, and then we put another domain within that, and we put another domain within that. And so each domain takes its, its boundary conditions and initial conditions from the next course's domain. Now, different models, the way they're coded, can run these type of nested calculations in different ways. Some models run them all at once, all the domains at once. Others would run this one, generate the boundary condition files, run this one, generate the boundary condition files for this one, etc. And so there's different approaches. And different models can do it in different ways. The approach I just told you about is called one-way nesting, where it's only the boundary conditions from the coarser domains feeding down to the finer domains. But there's also something called two-way ne nesting or interactive nesting where that information from the finer domains is fed back and averaged back onto the coarser domains, so modifies the flow on those coarser domains. Now, you might use um, one-way... Well, some models can only do one-way nesting. So the access model or the unified model can only do one-way nesting. The WARF model can do two-way nesting. The problem with two-way nesting is that if you do two-way nesting, that means that that high-resolution information is then averaged back onto the coarse resolution domain, and so you can't compare the effective resolutions because they're in intertwined. And so you need to be judicious about whether you're doing one-way or two-way nesting if you have that choice. Now, most models don't allow you to nest in the vertical. Basically, if you have 35 vertical levels on this outer domain, you have to have 35 vertical levels on the inner domain at the same, at the same height. Right? So there's no change in resolution as you go down. Um, now, I don't really like that. So one of the older models that I used years ago, you could do vertical nesting, and I thought that was really a really useful thing to do physically because, you know, if you're nesting from 30-kilometre grid spacing down to sub-kilometre grid spacing, you actually want more vertical resolution because you're resolving different features. And so there is a serious limitation of this type of nesting approach that you can't change the vertical resolution as you go down. Why do we do this? Well, I mentioned it earlier. Why do we nest? We nest down for a number of reasons. From a climate modelling perspective, this dynamical downscaling that people do for their climate modelling, you want to resolve topography better. This is what North America looks like on a very coarse resolution climate model. This is what North America looks like with a high resolution climate model. And so nesting down, you get a better representation of mountains, which are controlling all sorts of things about the climate system, and a better representation of coastlines. And this kind of nesting can give you much more local detail. And so here's an example from the Climate Futures Tasmania project where they've gone from a climate model um, projection of change in rainfall down to a regional projection of change in rainfall. 
Now, this is achieved, and you can look at this and say, wow, this comes straight from the global model. All of Tasmania is going to be drier. But then once you go to regional scales, you see that this projection is that, well, the eastern coast of Tasmania is going to be wetter and the western coast is going to be drier. And you gain that regional detail because you've got a better representation of the topography, but you also have a better representation of the physics and the interaction of the flow with that topography. On this course resolution, basically Tasmania is one grid, po grid box. So you can't get that east-west gradient in rainfall over one grid box. And it's probably questionable whether Tasmania is actually even in that model. Because of course resolutions, Tasmania disappears, New Zealand just disappears, things like that. So there's this real value in this nested approach and this downscaling approach if you're getting useful and realistic information from your coarser resolution. If you're not, there's a question at the back. Of course you can. So it depends on the model formulation. So what will often happen is it'll either be just a grid box by grid box approach where this grid box is a land grid box and this grid box is an ocean grid box. Or um, the model will say, okay, this is a mixed land ocean grid box as well. So it depends on the formulation in the model on their, on their land surface scheme. Um, so what was that? The, what I was saying was the regional downscaling is only useful if you're getting useful information from your course domain. Um, think about what controls the climate in Australia, some of the key drivers of climate in Australia El Nino, that's a good example. If your global climate model doesn't have an El Nino in it, or it has a very unrealistic El Nino, no matter what you do with regional downscaling over Australia, you're not going to create an El Nino, and so you're not going to have that large-scale climate drivers and large-scale climate impact. And so um, care must be taken in interpreting um, regional climate model information. So this is a great um, visualisation that Martin Yuka from UNSW put together of this kind of nesting approach where you can go from global models all the way down to large eddy simulations with this nested approach. You get refinements in physics, you get refinements in topography, but you have to be smart about what you do with those physics. And clouds and convection are a perfect example. At global model scales, we parameterize convection. And once we get to high resolution models, we don't need to parameterize convection anymore because we're starting to resolve the clouds and the convection. And so there needs to be, I hate to use the term, some switching off of some physics from the global model um, and switching on of physics for the regional model. Yeah, question. Yeah, only in the nested area, right? And actually, so basically you treat treat the nest as an independent model, and so in when you're solving the equations in that independent model, you will switch off in some physics. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that you have two way nested models. You can go from both resolution to one. Yeah. My question is that can you reproduce, is it reproducible that you go from, from low to high and if you do reverse, can you reproduce the signal? Can you reproduce it? Um, it is, I, I guess I don't really understand the question. Um, My question is that you mentioned in, in this attitude. Yeah, the two way, one way, yeah. yeah. 
generation, people from closer generation to higher generation. Yeah. And if we do the reverse, can we reproduce the signal we have in the heart source of radiation now? Right, no, you'd have to run the model twice to do that. Why? Um, because the way that the way it works when it, whether you're doing two-way nesting, it's every time step the high resolution model is feeding back onto the low resolution model. And so you basically lose that original information that you had in the low resolution model. And so the only way you could have a, a, a low resolution model without the impact of the high resolution model, if you're doing this two-way nesting approach, is actually to run the low resolution model twice. Run it without the high resolution model in it. So you'd run it by itself, or you could run it with the high resolution model in it and getting the feedback. Does that make sense? We have a million questions. Yeah, there, there, there. Okay. Uh, I have question one. Uh, I know you do Right, so if we go from the large scale to the small scale and change the equation, so the information that's fed from the large scale to the small scale really just comes in the boundaries. So it's a boundary condition file, so it's just U, V, W, temperature coming in the boundaries, and so then the high resolution domain is solved essentially independently taking in those boundary conditions. Some bias. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's um, a mismatch between the physics you're doing on the coarse resolution and the fine resolution. And I'll talk about that in a minute, how, how we see this mismatch. Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> Where what can evolve based on physics? Oh, yeah. Um, how grids can change based on physics. And this is done a lot in fluid mechanics, isn't it? So there's a um, where you've got dynamic grid refinement, this is what it's called, uh, where the, the grid scale will change based on what's going on in the solution. And so you can, where you have high vorticity, for example, you can get a finer resolution. I just want to know that it's possible that. Um, yes, the answer is yes, but it's not done, <laughs> right? <laughs> no one really does that, but it's possible, I think. Right, we have one more question somewhere. Okay, all right. Okay, so... I've got a few more slides and then we can probably have a break. Um, maybe he can have a break too. Um, so you might have seen a plot like this before. And this plot is um, showing the ongoing improvement in weather prediction models with time. And this is from the European Centres model. Um, this is from this paper in Nature, probably the only paper in Nature that on weather prediction that there will ever be because nature doesn't publish weather prediction papers. Um, but the forecast skill at different days is improving over time, right? We're getting about a day improvement per decade. So that means that if you look at from 2013 back to 2003, we're about halfway between that, and so we've gained an extra day in skill in that decade. The Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere have come together, so there's almost the same amount of skill between the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Now, that improvement in skill, or the agreement between Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, is because... <coughs> 
of the improvement in data, really satellite data. So our forecast improvement has improved for a number of reasons. Data and assimilation, so more data, more assimilation. And that's really responsible for the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere coming together. But also model improvement. And that model improvement has been improvements in model physics, improvement in model resolution as well. So they're all intertwined. But there are lots of errors, right? And there are sources of errors. And there are errors in initial conditions, which is a big issue for numerical weather prediction. Case study. So if you're looking at the initial value problem, forecast problem, there's sources of errors. Um, and this is different to equilibrium type climate experiments where you run to equilibrium before you force those experiments. And so then the initial conditions aren't really a source of error. There's errors in model physics, which makes an imperfect representation of the real world. And this is what our models are trying to do. Um, we have numerical errors, errors associated with the finite difference approximations, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And boundary condition errors as well. And this is important for regional models in particular. Here's an example of errors in physics. So this is a regional model looking at convection over Darwin again. Um, observations on the right here, water vapour and relative humidity. A simulation using one boundary layer scheme versus a simulation using another boundary layer scheme. And using these two different boundary layer schemes, which are both well-respected boundary layer schemes, what you see is there's quite a a notable difference in the diurnal cycle of relative humidity in this one versus this one. And the boundary layer was much drier using this boundary layer scheme and that ended up having these downstream influences, changing the convection, changing the rainfall because there was differences in the boundary layer. And so it's not just I have an error in my boundary layer scheme, it says, I have an error in my boundary layer scheme, and it feeds into errors in everything else. Okay, so model physics errors are really important for getting um, the best representation of the atmosphere or the ocean that we can. Now, some errors will come from the, directly from the boundary conditions, and some will come from internally from the physics. Let's just briefly talk about boundary condition errors, and then we can have a break. Got a couple of examples where at the bottom is an animation of solutions to the shallow water equations, the simplest nonlinear dynamical equations that we have. And the shallow water equations are really nice to conduct numerical experiments with. So the first set of boundary conditions we use, and here I'm talking about lateral boundaries more than anything, are periodic boundaries. Now, global models are periodic, and we use periodic boundary conditions for global models, which means that the signal repeats itself as you go round and round. And here's this experiment down the bottom showing um, periodic boundary conditions where this signal, this shallow water signal, is going round and round because the boundaries are periodic. Now, periodic boundary conditions are exact means that you could put a periodic boundary here, or here, or here, and it doesn't matter because um, if you code it properly, that boundary condition is invisible to the flow. That's why, I mean, it's exact. And you do this through indexing your equations when you're solving your equations of motion. All right, so we don't have to worry about lateral boundary conditions in global models. And if we're running an idealised model, such as a large eddy simulation model, we don't really need to worry about um, those boundary conditions either, just but we do need to have the knowledge that the information that travels outside one boundary comes back in the other. Okay. Here's another one. Fixed boundary conditions. Rigid wall boundary conditions. Now these are, here's our array, and we have a rigid wall at the end, and the way to implement that is you impose a, a zero velocity zero normal velocity at the end of that wall. 
This is also an exact boundary condition as well, but it's a, a reflective boundary condition. You can see these signals reflecting off the, the boundaries and they reflect perfectly well. We don't really want reflective boundaries in our atmospheric models because there are very few things that are physically, real, realistically reflect, except for the bottom boundary. This is quite different to the ocean, but in the atmosphere, we've got things flowing around. We don't have many large walls sticking up in the middle of the atmospheric flow to reflect signals. So these are not desirable. They're super easy to code, um, but they're not desirable. Okay, so uh, we need to work around fixed boundary conditions. And then we have open boundary conditions. Now, open boundary conditions are what we want most of the time for our regional models because open boundary conditions will allow information in and allow information out. And that information can be advection, so wind blowing stuff in or blowing stuff out, or wave propagation signals. And waves in the atmosphere propagate at a different speed to, um, to the flow. So here's our open boundary condition, and you can see, that I've coded up this open boundary condition, you can see some little ripples that reflected back off the boundary and didn't actually leave the boundary at all. And they keep on going, they keep on being reflected, and so you get these signals that bounce around inside your domain, and we get that a lot. In our regional models, there's signals that bounce around inside the domain and mess up our interior solution. And so we need to have our, boundary, our domains large enough to avoid this type of thing. Now the ways to do this, and what I did here was there's a, a simple way to do it with a, a solution to a linear wave equation that allows most of the signal out. You can do it with absorbing layers or sponges at the edge, and I'll talk about sponges in one second. Um, but the issue is that these open boundary conditions, no matter what you do, they're not exact and normally have some influence on the flow within some range of the boundaries and are partially reflected. So we need to bear that in mind. And you put your boundaries far enough away from your region of interest so that they don't unduly influence them. All right, bear with me, two more slides, then we can have a break, I think. Yes, we can. All right, vertical boundary conditions. Fixed boundary on the bottom, that's easy. Wind doesn't go through the ground. So the lower boundary condition is implemented as an exact boundary condition. It's fixed or reflective, where the velocity normal to the surface is zero. So on a flat surface, that means the vertical velocity is zero at the surface. On a sloped surface, it's the velocity normal to the surface. So in topography, it's actually the normal velocity that's zero. No wind going through the ground. What about the upper boundary? We want the upper boundary to be open. We want information to be able to propagate up through that upper boundary because we have lots of waves in the atmosphere that propagate upwards. We want them to go out. And here's an example. Idealised mountain wave. Air flowing over a mountain. Here's the vertical velocity above the mountain. Tiny little mountain here. This is your... Analytic solution, this is a numerical solution, but it reproduces the analytic solution with an open boundary condition at the top. The wave propagates up, continues up into the stratosphere, mesosphere, etc. Does its own thing up there. Don't really care about it as long as it goes up. If you put a fixed boundary here, a reflective boundary, so W equals zero at the top, that will reflect that wave energy back down into the troposphere and pollute your tropospheric solution and give you an unrealistic tropospheric solution. So we don't want that. So the way around this is you put your boundary, upper boundary really high, and most models these days have their upper boundary way into the stratosphere, but waves still propagate into the stratosphere and they can reflect back down. So you need some kind of open boundary condition at the top and the way to do that through these analytic approaches, you can formulate a linear solution, but also a common way is to use sponges. And the sponge layer is an absorbing layer. 
where you damp that solution back to some flow. And the simplest implementation is this, where you add this extra term on the right-hand side, which damps the solution. And here, this is actually what I showed before. It's that solution on the left. And the way I did that was through a sponge layer. And you can see as this wave propagates upwards, its amplitude is damped and it slows down. Well, it, doesn't slow, it does slow down, but the amplitude goes down and it's zero by the time it gets to the top of the domain. So there's nothing to reflect back downwards. You can do it with this term, this Rayleigh friction type term where it just damps the solution, or you can do it with enhanced diffusion as well up there. Um, the key thing is that inside your sponge layer, it's not a solution to the governing equations. It's a solution to this equation, which is a new equation set, your damped equation. So you can't use the solution inside your sponge layer. So if you're running a model or using a model, you need to know where that sponge layer actually is, if there is one. I did the simulation here. Looking at the solution in the bottom 10 kilometres, and the top 10 kilometres is a sponge. So I've used half of my computation on this upper boundary condition. So that's not particularly efficient. And so a combination of a shallower sponge with an analytic and open radiative boundary condition at the top is slightly more efficient. Now my key point here, most people don't think about this. They use their recommended, like you download WARF and you run the, the WARF recommended configuration. That recommended configuration normally has a, sh a sponge that is too shallow. And I'd say that I put money on the fact that most default upper boundaries in common community models are actually not particularly good at radiating waves out and they're not working properly. And so, and this is okay if you're interested in the lower troposphere probably, but if you're studying upper tropospheric or stratospheric dynamics, if you're studying wave processes, it's not okay. And so you need to be quite careful about this. Final slide before you can stretch your legs. Here's a regional model, a nested model. And this is looking at Here's Melbourne over here. This is looking at um, fire weather. This simulation doesn't really matter what the simulation was for, but we've nested down to, this is 400 metre grid spacing, and we nested down from a global model. And this one is nested within a one and a half kilometre resolution model. And the vertical velocity here shows these beautiful um, boundary layer roll patterns. And here's our strong vertical velocities flowing in. If you look closely, what you can see is these roll patterns coming in the boundary are very smooth. And then they start to break up. And so you see on this inflow boundary, there's this layer that's about 50 kilometers wide, which is much smoother than the rest of the domain. So this is a, a model spin-up issue. So we often think of spin-up issues as starting the model from scratch and it takes a while for the model to get going. But if you have a nested model with an inflow boundary, which you always would have in a nested model, information is coming in from a coarser domain where stuff is resolved on that coarser domain. It's got, it doesn't have those fine scale features that you can generate on this finer resolution domain. So it takes some time for those coarser resolution features to spin up or be broken down by instabilities to generate finer resolution information. You can alleviate this by putting random noise at the boundaries, but it, there's no perfect way to do this. The other way is to just be aware of it and put your boundaries far enough away from your region of interest and not conclude any useful bit of information about what's coming in here. Now this 50 kilometer distance here, you can work out approximately why that is. So the flow is coming in at 20 meters per second. And so for a 20 meter per second flow to go about this 50 kilometers, it's about 40 minutes. 
Now, it just so happens that 40 minutes is the time it would take for one of these boundary layer eddies to go from the surface up to the top of the boundary layer and back down. That's the eddy time scale or what's called the convective overturning scale. So about the time scale of, of one eddy going up and down is relates to the distance. Well, that time scale defines that distance because that's an effective distance. Okay, and so um, if you have very fast flow, that, that spin-up might be quite different to very slow flow, right? but it all depends on the situation. So I'm going to pause there, and we're going to have a break. How long should we break?